Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build with us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Johnny Law and Courtney Staples. On today's episode, we are finishing up part two of longtime patron Diplo Raptors prompt. But before we get into that, remember that this is part two. So please, if this is your first time listening, Go back and listen to that first part. Otherwise, things are going to be real confusing. It, it, it might sound, oh, cut that. That's fine. But before we get into that even further, uh, I want to remind everyone that if you want us to build your world, like we're building Diplo Raptors, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, where you can click the link, follow some instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we can be building your world. Now, without further ado, the last we left off in this Land of giant priapisms is our twist was now add in animal companions. And I I don't often do this, especially with John around, but I'm going to start first because Courtney, I'm going to be very gross and I'm going mm. to kind of shift what someone might consider an animal companion. I was considering, hey, we've just, we've got a giant crab that is currently rotting off the continent of this giant cloud giant, giant cloud giant, whatever. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, okay, well, what is an animal companion? Normally, it's like, oh, it's it's golden compass. They're cute, and they're polar bears, or perhaps some kind of a furret or something like that. But I was like, well, what else is an animal com animal companion? Maybe some kind of giant parasite, maybe some kind of internal worm that is fortifying you in some way. And so my tenet, my reconciliation with the twist is the longer you are on the island, the continent of the cloud giant, the more likely it is that you are to acquire some kind of parasite from the corpse of the giant crab. All right, cool. I thought you're gonna. I thought you're gonna go over what I was doing, but it still works. <laughs> oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking like ticks that latch on that are like the size of backpacks, or <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, or or like worms that kind of like when people open their mouths, they might slither out or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking some really horrific shit, although it depends on the exact type of parasite we're talking about here. But those are just some of the delightful ideas that I had. John, you said that I might be tiptoeing over you or, or stepping on your toes. Yeah. So what did you have in mind? What were you thinking? Sidestep me completely. It's fine. So I was taking more of the, the you actually have like animal companions, such as in Golden Compass with all, you know, it can all be different flavors of animal companions. They can be big, they could be small. I'm not really dead set on that. But what my, uh, what my reconciliation is, is that the animals are actually the higher intelligence on the planet. And they use the humans as like vessels, basically, like the, or vassals, I should say, not vessels. Um, so like the humans are like cavemen. Interesting, actually, <laughs> that that pairs well with mine. I think just because I'm thinking about, you know, like oh no, my my pet got, you know, heartworm or something yeah. like that. And that pet just so happens to be a human. You yeah, know? and maybe they're actually it's a competition of sorts. Like where they, you know, like they, you know, only one thing can be controlling the human. So oh. maybe the parasite replaces the animal. Oh, so, oh, that's actually really interesting because the implication there actually, yeah. I mean, what you can do there is you can create this kind of conflict where the animal companion is kind of control through partnership and mm -hmm. the parasite is, con is control through, you know, d dominion or, or domination. Yeah. Speak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's like the the companion has a symbiotic relationship of of sorts, and they're psychically linked to the to their human yeah. or their human. And meanwhile, yeah, and meanwhile the parasites are literally that. Yeah. Oh man, that works remarkably well, and yeah. now allows me to go even grosser with the kind of parasites that I had in mind. So that's perfect. Sweet. Hmm. Ooh, what would giant bot flies look like yeah. if they're like, yeah, if they're like the size of like loaves of bread or something like that? Like, Just like for the head or like chest burster kind of thing, basically. I, yeah. I was thinking that they're like buried in there and they're like, they look like, like, uh, like meteorites stuck out of people in some way or something like that. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. goes right in. This is hand in hand with our off air Sekiro uh, conversation with the centipedes, you know? Some- oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Holy yeah. shit. Okay. Yeah. You're 100% correct. Yeah. What's the that. centipede thing as somebody who hasn't played Sekiro? I just- literally don't want to spoil that because oh, okay. uh, it is one of, I, I think it's one of the coolest moments in the game or one of the most shocking moments. It happens a couple of times. And there's, I mean, without uh, mild, spo- there's yes. certain things that centipedes live in. That you wouldn't have to live in. And you can actually a great great way to put it. Yes. Yeah. One of your prosthetics is a spear, and you can actually spear them and pull the centipede out. Uh. And do an extra damage. It's pretty cool. Ooh, I like I like the idea of a centipede. Now, you know what? We're yeah. we're canonizing that. The centipedes are now going to be part of the parasite community. So <laughs> there we go. Everybody get <laughs> in here. oh man yeah oh this is this is even better now because i get to go so gross with it okay great Mm -hmm. awesome courtney how gross did you go with your reconciliation with the twist what did you have in mind for please tell me that you're like i actually have cute animal companions (laughs) (laughs) something like that not quite but yeah i didn't go necessarily as as gross uh Likewise, I interpret it as like everyone in this region has a companion and I interpreted animal companion as some sort of like spirit type creature that actually fell down from the atmosphere when the sky giant fell and was drawn to the energy or psychic energy or whatever of the people living here. Um, But I think that definitely works with what you guys talk or especially Rob, what you talked about with the crab parasite things going on. maybe maybe the spirit aspect is just the fact that this thing came from the sky or outer space i think we had talked about it was a space crab perhaps um it was in fact a space crab. yes yeah. yeah uh so i think that works and i guess there could also be like um bits of the sky giant if we wanted some sort of conflict there like ready-made conflict if some of the parasites are of the space crab and some of the parasite things are more spirit sky giant entities. Hmm. Okay. Uh, who here has seen the show, the brilliant Canadian show that is beast wars, the transformers spinoff. I have not. Oh, I saw parts of it back in the day. Yeah. That was really good. Wasn't it? It, it is surprisingly good. The, the animation is janky as hell. I mean, it's from the same studio that did Reboot. But, uh, okay, it is surprisingly good. But basically the way that it works is that the Autobots and the Decepticons come down to Earth during a time period where they can't walk around in robot form for too long. And so in order to be able to be on Earth's atmosphere, they have to take on robot or animal disguises so they can blend in better. Honestly, Courtney, I know this sounds corny as fuck, but that kind of reminds me of what we're talking about here. (laughs) We have like two conflicting factions in, uh, you know, like the good animals and then the gross parasites. But that's basically like that's basically the 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 two factions that we got going on here. And then the fact that mm-hmm. they have to like use humans in some way to like inhabit or influence the world. I think I'm not saying that we go full Beast Wars, but I think that there's <laughs> something there that we can use as like, oh, there's an ex- like they need humans as vessels in some way right yeah yeah i think with like the sky giant ones maybe it's more like they need that physical form to latch on to if they're like these spiritual little yeah. things that like spores yeah. even that kind of fell yeah. off of the sky giant um whereas the the crab things i assume are just like straight up parasites that need to like eat nutrients that the humans get and stuff so are we saying that the the spirit animals that are psychically linked with the humans are originally from the sky giant so therefore there'd be no more new ones yeah like i was kind of thinking about that too like if if we think of them as some sort of spore um i guess that might imply that there could be a future sky giant but maybe um maybe it's just like no longer the right atmosphere for that sort of thing like normally the the spores would inhabit the sky and form a new one there or something but since they're now down on the earth they can't do that anymore okay i i was thinking about this as well like 
I like the idea that we're using the animals and humans to propagate or, or attempt to propagate again. I was also thinking that these could be like fonts of magic, right? Because if the world of magic is dying, right, we, we established that in the previous episode, then what's to say that these are not like ways that humans can still use magic in some way? Like maybe mm -hmm. only new way that people can use magic is through parasite or animal companion now and it's through this connection that there's still some level of magic that happens uh, oh maybe the spores are like from its dying breath as it hit the earth because we talked about the the lungs being the source of magic potentially true true yeah. so we've basically got like midichlorians going on God, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay but no, no, no. Okay, I say basically, but it's our job to make midichlorians a good idea that is smart and cool. So, yeah. John, what do you got for that? Uh, yeah, no, I like the idea that maybe, um, all right, so backtracking a little bit. The animal companions are a race from this land, but somehow they're able to interact with the dying breath. It's like almost like a spirit-like uh, echo of them. Yeah, th I think that's what we're going with so far. And also it's like a breath of life, like literally yeah. a breath of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So it sounds like we've we've established something really interesting here. Uh, I love this kind of push pull. I like the multiple animal companion factions. I love the fact that I can bring up Beast Wars. And speaking of factions, I would love for us to figure out what kind of maybe perhaps human factions we've created this time. So Courtney, why don't you start us off this time? What did you get for us? What is your faction for this episode? All right. Um, I wanted to do something a bit different than what I typically do. So like, I'm not going with blood sacrifice, witches or anything like that yet. Anyway, um, I was thinking more along the lines of like a, a nearby small Island uh, society or clan that's considered relatively primitive compared to um, other civilizations that are now like coming to the sky giant area to harvest resources but um, they are essentially like monster hunter types uh, that value you know the natural world and and collecting um, perhaps parts of monsters and creatures to do things with uh, as resources and given the large creatures that live on the sky giant and also the crab as well. Um, I think that is their main target. They don't care so much about colonizing, but just about uh, gathering trophies and, you know, hunting for the biggest, most ferocious creature they can find. Um, and in terms of flavor and like how they're getting here, I am picturing that they actually use flying creatures to travel around. So like giant birds or like pterodactyl type things um, that are native to their islands that they've tamed and they come swooping down onto the sky giant continent to explore and uh, kill some monsters. Very cool. Uh, love. I, I do love, look, I love monster hunter. I love mm -hmm. anything can allude to that uh i gotta first of all having like a, a a bird thing is a great way that you can you know kind of shoehorn in fast travel into an open yeah. world game so a plus there two i don't know why i'm just imagining these giant birds as parakeets uh that, <laughs> that just kind of where my brain went when you said giant bird i, I not guess like works. Pterodactyls. not pterodactyls no they're, they're <laughs> parakeets. Um, might as well i guess <laughs> yeah, but but third and perhaps most importantly, one thing I, I wanted to talk about here, and one thing I think is makes a lot of sense if we do this, um, I love the idea that they are driven by a hunt or a need for reputation, mm -hmm. right? Like food is one thing. Yes, they want to thrive. They want their society to go on, but it's that's less important than we are here for the legend. We are here yeah. for the thrill of the hunt, mm -hmm. and one thing I'm really curious about is how does this like, how does this kind of express itself in, in like in day-to-day -day culture and like, how do they display their trophies? Obviously if we're going to a monster hunter, it's like literally built into the armor and the weapons. That yeah. they have, 
right? Like that's a huge, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. But like, in in what other ways is this like trophy hunting kind of front and center within the expression of the culture? Yeah, I was definitely thinking like their armor, uh, the armor that they're flying mounts wear, which I guess are now very brightly colored parakeets. <laughs> And uh, they don't I, have to be, by the way. It's just like that's where my twisted ass, dumbass <laughs> mind went. Uh, went. Up. I, I kind of so, like the imagery though, because like I don't know. I was thinking of just sort of you know pterodactylish uh, dinosaur creatures or something like that. But the fact that there are these like very bright, distinct, um, kind of cute but giant birds is. I don't know, not something you typically see very often, um, you know, especially I, I for mean, like ferocious warrior clans. Yeah, and I, we joke, but honestly, the colors could be like an expression of how ostentatious they are and like how yeah. much that matters to them. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, but yeah, uh, so the armor, of course, and weaponry, um, I think it would be mainly more back in their civilization like they construct buildings and huts out of these monster parts um but yeah like the can see it in like their buildings their construction um and i imagine too if they're going to be flying to this new foreign land they're probably coming with like like standards and flags and that sort of thing to like show how how great they are uh flying in with these displays of past creatures that they've killed to sort of not even intimidate the others that are going to be there but just be like hey look at us we're we're fucking awesome check us out i love okay yeah when you say like coming in and like showing off like i love the idea that they're bringing in like uh massive banners Mm -hmm. that are you know like made up of various like skins hides and other things that are indicative of like this is my house and this is what we've killed or this is yeah. like we're known for killing that kind of thing you know yeah. i'm picturing like you know the banners that go behind the planes at the beach. i was just thinking that too. <laughs> <laughs> like eat at joe's yeah. eat at rock dogs <laughs> yeah i could totally see that like uh, but, uh, but even so, like, the- of stuff yeah yeah, but like the longer the trail, the, one, the harder that poor parakeet has to get <laughs> a drag there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's also like, okay, what if that's like part of it as well, where it's like, listen, I need two parakeets to cap to bring all of my, <laughs> yes. you know, like all of my hunts with me or all of my kills with me, something like that. Could I have yeah. like a parakeet chariot, basically? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, I love it. Oh man, yeah. I'm also now picturing a, a it's a parakeet like pterodactyl hybrid. I'm trying to generate an image right now. I'm having the best time doing it though. But, like I see like like, like a longer neck to it, like like pterodactyl has. Yeah. But still the parakeet like markings yeah. and face mm-hmm. face. Okay, I'm I'm now also thinking like what does their Santa Claus look like? Because it's just like there's like 12 parakeets in this thing. Like it has a sack so full of like all of the organs and various <laughs> apex predator claws that you've wanted all year long. You know, <laughs> you, you can follow his trail by like the trail of blood and viscera behind his his Oh sled. yeah, <laughs> yeah. His carnal path. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I love our new Santa Claus. Hell yeah, mm-hmm. let's go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, all right. So, uh, very cool faction. Very interesting to see like an outsider sort. Uh, John, what have you got for us? What kind of faction are you bringing to our twisted land of giants? So, I initially was thinking I wanted like a faction back on the the main uh, island or populace or whatever the the you know whoever the story revolves around uh fully but i wanted them to be like almost like giant deniers but i feel like that's kind of hard to to pull off because like how they gonna actually deny that there's an actual landmass that's now in that just has appeared um so instead i think that they're actually more like luddites and they they don't they don't believe in technology they put all their like they're like very hardcore magic only um like no other sort of progress and so they will obviously be coming into uh kind of a wake up call soon enough when they realize that they're the thing that they rely on to live their day-to-day lives is going to slowly start ebbing. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're saying that they're magic only? Because when I think of Luddite, I think of like anti-technology. Yeah. But in the, but in this case, like I often like equate magic with technology. So you're well, suggesting that they're pure magic only, right? Yeah, like, I think magic's going to have to replace, or technology is going to have to replace magic. Like we're have there have to have right. there's gonna be more of a reliance on technology moving forward if the magic is is slowly seeping out of this world. Right. So you're you're using Luddite like almost literally where it's like anti yeah. Yeah. anti technology technology. Anti progress. Yeah. yeah. Right. Which is which is unfortunate because the original Luddites, I actually have been reading The Golden Thread, which is a book which a book on history of like textiles and, textiles, and yeah. stuff like that. Uh yeah. And they're they're anyway, I'm I'm getting off topic. We're not gonna get into that right now, but it <laughs> is it is interesting to see how history has treated the Luddite, especially in the term. Anyway. So in terms of their influence on the island, John, how do you see these folks treating the island? What are they doing here? Are they trying if they're not interested in harvesting like giant parts, because I'm assuming that's technology. What are they yeah. doing here? What's up with that? Well, I feel like they, they parts uh, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure in the some form of the political transfer there, they're, they're, they're involved. Um, so there's like higher ranking ones that are trying to, you know, keep laws that to, you know, limit what sort of technologies could be brought into the society and what can be brought back from this giant back to the mainland. Mm. Um, but I also think like on the, on the lower scale, like the, the unwashed masses, they're actually like sabotaging ships and stuff like that. And they're, they're like really trying to like keep people from going to uh, this giant. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I know that you said like they, or you had originally thought of them being like, giant deny deniers yeah, and yeah. went away from that idea but i could kind of see them being crab deniers or like okay they don't they don't believe that the crab is like an otherworldly thing they think it's like i don't know some other like naturally like occurring thing or um or yeah, that they, there was never a crab to begin with oh, maybe, like yeah it. since it's like decaying and stuff yeah or it's just like some weird cancerous growth on top of the giant something like that yeah. Yeah. Or just, or just that, you know, that the, the, maybe that was the government, the government took out the giant. <laughs> mm -hmm. and they, uh, I mean, it's, it's this false flag, false crab. <laughs> it's just rocks. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. Those are, that's not a crab. It's just rocks that I don't know why you, people, people think that things look like things, right? Like, mm -hmm. but they're just rocks. Like that's all they are. And pe I'm sick of people trying to tell me that this is an animal. There's no such creature that's that big. Yeah, mm -hmm. same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So functionally, they are pirates, right? Or or they're kind of like, antagonistic to Yeah, newcomers. antagonistic. They they don't want they they're against uh you know the manifest destiny of going to this uh to this giant corpse and, and harvesting and, and colonizing. Um they just want to keep things as they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Are they um, interested in or studying the spore creature things from the giant that potentially have like magic energy? I think so. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift my idea a little bit. I think they're like just they're they're literally just anti this whole movement and this whole change okay. of era. Yeah. Um, so maybe that they, they like they're they're. I think it's more like they're like we're fine as we are. Why would we do? Why would we risk? these wars oh, okay. and these and this travel and all this and but what's going to happen is they're going to realize that they're not fine things like the magic eventually yeah. coming. Okay. um and i and i do think like there's like there's a faction of them like almost like a tea party-esque that's you know pretty high up in politics and mm -hmm. just causing mm -hmm. a lot of gridlock and whatnot as as I'm, you know this this fantasy mm -hmm. world is trying to uh get shit done mm -hmm. I mean, the way that I'm kind of into, I'm, I'm approaching them is why are you wasting your time? Things are so bad back at home. We need to focus our energy and attention there. All of this, like colonizing all of this yeah. kind of re resource redirection, it's harming us. So we're going to put up roadblocks. We're going to sabotage people who are trying to go out and go to the island itself because we want you to turn around. We want yeah. you back at home where thing mm -hmm. where we need you. you know, like mm -hmm. that kind of 
And if we go back to the, the animal thing of mine, like I feel like it's a certain type of animal too that's really locked in on this. Like I'm trying to think what what animal like I I picture cats actually because like they're scared of water. I don't like water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like no wait why are we why are we getting on boats? We're fine here. <laughs> mm, I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of other hydrophobic animals and I'm struggling to think of them actually. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No. All right. Or I guess well, I guess rabies makes you hydrophobic. There you go. Oh, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's actually really interesting, Courtney, because the the implication here is that there is something wrong with this particular animal companion. These yeah. are like the ones that have like gone off because it's like mm. we are actually just hydrophobic now because we have rabies. Oh, they're in okay. They are animal companions infected by the parasite or in infected in part by the crab's influence, right? Yet they deny the crab. Yeah, <laughs> because they're denying what's wrong with themselves. If they yeah. acknowledge that they got this thing from the crab, they'd have to acknowledge that there's something to fix. They'd have to acknowledge that there's something wrong with them and they refuse to do any kind. People will conquer worlds to not go to therapy and this is what these animal companions are doing no self-reflection mm -hmm. at all yes exactly right so if they're in infected with that are you picturing them like their civilization is very close to where the giant and the crab fell to the earth um i mean maybe even that they that maybe it's something that's like a generational thing that there was name you know not necessarily a crab before this crab but maybe there was some kind mm -hmm. of visitor in the past and that it has left um you know like a smaller crab so to speak I mean, it was like a seahorse <laughs> um but like it had you know there's some other influence from the outside world that has created this this faction over time and they're okay. just like yeah they're just they lack internal dialogues and uh or monologues and they uh I just want to be a thorn in the side of progress, basically. Yeah. No, I could see that being like a previous thing, or maybe like maybe the, the space crab has been approaching for a very long time and it sent out what people saw as like meteors, um, but what were actually like poop. Almost like, <laughs> well, that I, I guess that works. I was thinking we're like some sort of scout crab type being. Scout crabs. Scout crabs. Emissaries. Or, you know, or poop, yeah. whatever, whichever, either well, one. So, so this is actually really interesting because now this implies that the emissaries landed amongst these hydrophobic people and they were among the first to, oh, actually, maybe the denial is part of like the defense or the offensive capabilities of the crab where it's like, oh, yeah. oh that's not real. That's fake. It's kind of like, um, when the when mice have that thing that make them less afraid of cats, you know, like mm -hmm. toxoplasmosis, yeah. like it's it's basically that, right? Like the, yeah. the crab is sending out these emissary things, like don't worry about the crab. There's no giant crab. What are you talking yeah. about? You know, so yeah. the crab can like feed on the populace while they're yeah. just or, like, oh, or feed on the magic potentially. Oh, that's why the yeah. big one went for the giant itself, and that's why the emissaries focused on this one culture in particular. That's completely focused on magic okay oh that's really smart yeah i like it fucking nailed it look at look mm -hmm. at us look at this like stretching and grabbing things like tying things together look at that great job guys this is awesome the old okay. machine yeah <laughs> uh all right so we've got my faction left uh i, I think i had mentioned earlier i'm not sure if this was on podcast or off but i started a new playthrough of elden ring because Shadow of the Erd Tree is out right now. And uh, I wanted to start fresh. I want to start with a new character. And I switched over systems. So heavily influenced by the Souls series in particular, I wanted to create a kingdom who their kingdom itself was lost during the conflict between the giant and the crab. So... Okay. Therein lies the the thing. Like their 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 kingdom is wiped out, and however, uh, many of them survived. They were mostly a seafaring people. They were uh, bastions of virtue and 
if we were going with a traditional D and D alignment, they'd be lawful good. And so now, because they no longer have a kingdom, they've been forced to repopulate on the new island because their land literally doesn't exist. And what's been going on is not necessarily a decay in the physical sense, a decay in the magical sense. I want the king of this world or the queen of this island to start making terrible decisions oh, that make sure that their population survives. I want it to be a moral decay more than anything else. They haven't taken a deal with the parasites. They haven't taken any kind of like, uh, you know, like there's, there's no cosmic influence on these decisions. This is someone who's just said, listen, I have to protect my people. And if it means that I am corrupt morally, that then so be it. If I have to mm -hmm. abandon every virtue and value that I once had to save my people, I will do so. So my children and their children will have some place to grow up and have a kingdom of their own. Thus, they are new colonizers. And thus, they have been slowly turning more and more to piracy to mm -hmm. ensure that they are able to gather the resources necessary, whether that means Oh, I don't know, press ganging people into servitude, for example, or uh, basically telling people, listen, you come, you'll live with us, but you're going to be indentured servants, and then you'll be able to, you know, like pay off any kind of debt because they need people, they need laborers, and they need resources. And they're using all of these previous resources that they had as amazing naval capable people and turning it towards slowly, well, not maybe not so slowly, but eventually they are slowly turning into a more evil and corrupt kingdom. No, that makes sense. I like that. Like desperate times call for very desperate measures, I guess. So are they, are they the bad guys then? No, kind of. Yes. Yeah. Also. Sure. Uh, so, it's, so it's a great, it's a gray area all around, right? Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's part of what I'm interested in exploring is this idea that, how corrupt are they and you know like how necessary are the evils that they're committing you know like yeah. that's the other thing that i'm really interested in is exploring this kind of moral dynamic or moral panic that they're having where we used to be the paladins of this world and now we're turning into barbarous you know like pirates like what's going on with us and our culture and so there's mm -hmm. obviously that kind of like infighting between the culture that they once had and the culture that they have to be in order to survive this new world. I, I like the idea, though, that they, um, you know, they set their camp up at by the feet of the giant. So they're literally the heels. Ah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. If they set up near the face, then they'd be baby faces. So that wouldn't necessarily work out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think we kind of established that most of the people are will be fighting over the head because it, that seems like the most, you know, that's where the most mm. hair is. But then, you know. Except for Dick Legion. That yeah, well, that's that. They're they're the true bad guys. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're like the tactical right. masterminds. And honestly, I think that that's I think that that's honestly why they wouldn't be near the feet. I think they would probably take up more towards the arms and chest of this mm -hmm. world because they're like we're more interested in establishing like land that we can have rather than yeah. the magic. And like, yes, that's nice, but also maybe that's less important to them than just having some place that they can ha call a home. Yeah. But like, like both, both with the, you know, the limbs, like I feel like that's really good spaces to uh, set up docks and whatnot. Like, you know, the, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. fingers and stuff like that. Like you can really set up some good seafaring spaces there. Yeah. I was honestly thinking about like hands and being from Cape Cod where it looks like yeah. a flexing mm -hmm. bicep, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that totally makes sense to me, especially because if you look at the hand and you look at how hands could like settle into geographic spaces, mm -hmm. the amount of like inlets and tiny yeah. little causeways that they have for smuggling operations or, you know, like having places that they could hide things like all of that stuff. It's kind of like Maine is similar in that way where there's a lot of smuggling in and out of Maine through the waterways just because, it's very porous and it's very like craggy. Uh, this is not me explaining it well, but there's a lot of places where you can like, uh, nooks and crannies. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It, that that is that is more or less what I'm looking for. Yeah. So, John, do you still have that conversion spreadsheet? Uh, I, I'm. Yeah, it's not really a spreadsheet. I lied to you about that. But uh, I, I do have some numbers here. I okay, just I was just spreadsheet. curious, like how big the, how the hand you? was, how, uh, how large so, the hands would be, and fingers and stuff like that. Do, do what's I? Uh, so six miles, just over six miles, would be the hand size. Okay, that's pretty decent. Yeah, you know, like hand thickness is like just. Over, I'm just looking at mine. It's just over an inch. I mean, it's like let's say an inch, just to be easy. You know, obviously it varies as you go. Yeah, I got thick sausage fingers. So actually, they're not even thought they're not even sausage, they're just thick. They're just like bony boys, you know. So so the height of a finger would be about 4,208 feet. Hmm, okay. Um, so short of a mile, but you would think it also probably would sink into, you know, it'd be partially underwater. Well, I'm also thinking that it could be like, depending on how they land it, it could be like a curled hand, like it's holding on to something mm. as well. So yeah. you could have this really interesting, like, uh, deviation and elevation and stuff like that, which would be oh. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. if you have those palm up too, it could have like the fingers oh, yeah, that up like crags and there'd be like a little lagoon in the middle in the palm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd yeah. Be cool. Oh man, when I uh, I was I was hiking in the Rocky Mountains recently and I got up to this point I'm like I feel like I'm in a giant's hand right now because the way that the peaks were kind of curling in, it felt really intense. It was really cool. You literally could be in this place. Yeah, quite literally. All right, so we we've got factions. We know how big hands are. And <laughs> we've reconciled the twist. The only thing left for us to do is to create a main storyline which incorporates all of our factions in the world in some interesting and fun way. So let's see, I made, I went first and then Courtney went first. So John, I believe that leaves you. What are you thinking for the main storyline quest? What kind of interesting or fun idea are we starting us off with? I think, I think the main quest should follow you know, someone from the, the original larger continent um, that is landed on the head and is dealing with not only the you know human to human conflicts, but also the human versus nature, um, and then kind of like the the paranormal aspect would be more like the parasites. Um, and maybe they are one of the first to realize about the the new spores, mm, yeah, animals, and they're kind of like an enlightenment. Um, I would actually like it to be, turn into like where they where they actually start to embrace the island more and more as the story goes on and they they become, mm -hmm. you know, like they almost kind of reject the other ways, the old ways and society in general. So like a return to monkey kind of situation. Yeah. So, or just or just like, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, set, like... set to the soundtrack of Radiohead's Kid A. And... <laughs> oh, see, I was thinking of Viagra Boy's Return to Monkey. Uh, which, which is, uh, very appropriate considering what we're talking about here. Um, I'm like, I see like a certain form of enlightenment coming on as a, as a deal with these, with the horrors of humanity and, uh, you know, war for resources as yeah. well as the, the, uh, cosmic horrors of crab parasites. Yeah. I could see it be like an existential thing where yeah. they get there and search for resources or whatever but as they discover and learn more it's like wait like why are we bickering over these random you know fingernails or bits yeah. of hair and things when like this this crab came from the vastness of space and we have no idea what's out there like we should just mm. live and and do what Unite we can enjoy yeah enjoy life while we can it it sounds to me as though that is effectively the animal companions, the kind of psychic link. That's their influence on the humans who are on this island, right? The longer they create these bonds and strengthen these bonds with the humans themselves, the stronger control they have, which means that they're going to have more uh, influence over, yeah, no, this is, you know, like, it, okay, I'm going, it, it is close enough to July 4th where I'm going to say this is an American idealistic opportunity, you know, where it's like mm -hmm. we have no shared past, but together we can have a shared future together on this island. So I'm thinking maybe even this protagonist uh, is somehow 
released from their psychic bond with their controlling companion. And that's like, that's how the enlightenment begins. They're like, Oh, like, meanwhile, we've, we've been having these things dictate our lives, you know, through generations and generations or, you know, since the dawn of civilization there, Mm. but that they're, they actually can, they can have free will and they can start, go back to nature and start from the beginning again. So you're suggesting that there's some kind of strength to be found here. So how would you incorporate the various factions that we've got going on then? I think they're they're all in opposition to this this you know whatever this journey is. Um, maybe with the slight exception of the monster hunters, because I think they kind of get it. Like they they kind of have a they understand that even though what they they they're hyper focused on one aspect of life and and bonding with nature, but they're uh, they're not like they're, they're they're not trying to go for material goods and just and claiming things and you know consumerism. I guess in a way they are kind of materialistic because they do like take uh, trophies and such. Um, so maybe there's an epiphany there too. Like, oh wait, us collecting giant animal skulls doesn't really do anything <laughs> in the long run. Like maybe we should do something else. I like, yeah, I definitely like the idea that this is, this enlightenment comes from Courtney's faction because it is this kind of um, spiritual awakening, this kind of progressivism that comes from the society that seems very uh, solipsistic in a way, like very insular in a way where they only care about their culture. And then this is someone who's like, I've broken free from this kind of ideal. What can we do that incorporates a lot of the things that we're already doing that benefits everyone? But what is the inciting incident that creates this? What is, what happens that this prophet, so to speak, or this group of people recognizes that things need to change? Maybe it has to do with uh, those horrific parasites from the crab, like taking people over, and it basically gives them a gives everyone a much much larger threat to focus on. So I'm thinking like maybe that they um, like I, I going with that, that maybe what happened was they had one of these these, uh, you know, a member or several members of the Luddite faction on board that were there to sabotage their operations. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they kind of got tossed off and like stranded out on their own. And then through that, you know, they come across the, the pirate uh faction as well as the monster hunter faction they're trying to find like their place back in the world and that's kind of what leads them to and then eventually that parasite they have an encounter with the parasite and they lose their companion or kind of left a sea so to speak Mm -hmm. picturing it kind of like scavengers reign Mm, as as they get like deeper and deeper into this giant ecosystem a little lord of the fliesy too like Mm -hmm. you know becomes like a they start worshiping either the the memory of the giant or maybe the spacecraft. I don't know. Well, I guess it would be the spacecraft. Yeah. I thought you meant there was just going to be a fat kid with glasses, but that works oh, too. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the character who I uh, identified with most in that book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking that if we're creating like a, mess- a messianic figure or a messianic kind of epiphany, I'm imagining that this is going to be like uh, the Bodhisattva, right? Where you have to go through all of these different experiences before you can reach enlightenment to a certain point. So I'm imagining that there is, hey, I have an animal companion and then it gets stripped away from me and replaced with one of these parasites. And then that gets stripped away from me. So you're experiencing, you know, like the entire spectrum Mm -hmm. of existence. And then, you know, uh, again, it's a journey. Right. And then at the end, this kind of epiphany happens. And it's like we can do it without anything, but we with everything at the same time. I feel like this journey could include all of the factions that we've created. Mm-hmm. And you know, you start as perhaps one of the monster hunter factions with nothing, with no preconceived notions. You fly in on your parakeet, you get infected by one of the parasites, you are purged of it by uh, one of the companions who then takes you over and then you manage to rest that away on your own 
experiencing all the different factions along the way. And then this kind of epiphany moment is to watch the once proud pirate faction slowly become corrupt, witnessing, you know, what happens in the world and recognizing that we want to do better. We want to do more. And then that's enlightenment. W watching all of these things come together, right? Like ex because the Buddha witnesses suffering for the first time as a very privileged person. It's like, Oh shit, what's this? And then through that whole, that starts the whole journey. Right. We'll definitely uh, fast forward the, the, you know, the seven weeks of sitting underneath the fucking tree though. That's, that's just boring. <laughs> just do a montage. Well, I, I imagine that tree, 49 days, it's a montage. <laughs> well, see, you say that, but I think it'd be a lot more interesting if that tree were also a giant dick. You know, instead of sitting under the, the <laughs> moon, yeah, mm -hmm. see, see, I'm, I got you back in. I got you back in with the with the anatomy of the giant, and that's where world building happens, guys. Right? Like, and then you know, obviously, we start worshiping the dick as a as a religious symbol, and then it becomes a whole thing. No, I'm kidding. We we don't, we, we, we don't go that far. Uh, but honestly, I think that having like a religious experience that leads to some kind of enlightenment, I, I think that could work. Uh, I think that we need more characters than just the one guy, but or the one person. But what do y'all think? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it, I think it works. And like I had mentioned before, um, potentially uniting against a larger threat. Like, what if part of the epiphany is like, oh, if another one of these crabs comes to this planet, like we're just doomed with the way that we currently are. Like, we need to join together to be stronger in case something else happens like this because we don't have the sky giants to protect us anymore. Nothing brings people together like the threat of total annihilation. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, I think we could do that. I, where are we thinking in terms of like characters? What kind of cool characters do you want to see in a setting like this? That's, that's where I want to go with this and just see like what kind of cadre of folks we can have here. I, I mean, if it was, if it, if we weren't, starting with just one person that we that's the focus i think you could actually take strays from all the different factions mm -hmm. and kind of and kind of justify why they would ban and start following this person's ways um so that's one way to do it otherwise we could do it it's a small group from the island that gets separated from uh from the original island and gets separated from their uh boarding party basically and they then just try to survive together. I think you could do something like that as well, but I, th I think I like the, the former. Yeah, of like group of individuals from different groups. I like that too. Like they slowly pick up along the way. And yeah. kind of like, you know, then you got this whole like apostle thing going on too. Yeah. And I could see like, um, like how Daniel and his OSR Plus games has like archetypes that you can pick from when you create mm -hmm. a character. I could see it similar here. Like a character that comes to mind uh, is oddly enough like a an orphan type who somebody kind of like scrappy and survival mm -hmm. oriented from the um from rob's faction who's yeah, like you know been raised in this sort of ruthless and justify the means mindset um and has been on their own for so maybe they got separated from their own group or the rest of their group was killed when they tried to do some sort of ambush or something uh and they come across this monster hunter who's dramatically changed their mindset and and maybe even initially tries to take advantage of that but eventually yeah. learns the their ways i could also see like one of the original saboteurs that started off this whole chain of event events mm -hmm. like being set out on their own and there's, there's a little bit of a um you know, there has to be a, a an element of forgiveness given there as they're coming to learn how they were wrong and that the, what they were doing was not, you know, they were protecting anything. They were just halting progress and, and mm -hmm. being, being a doucher. How, how do we feel about this idea that this is a collective Messiah rather than a singular messianic figure? Because I feel like with religions, it's often comes down to a singular person. And I understand like mechanically why that would be the case mm -hmm. uh, or culturally why that would be the case. But I think it might be really interesting if it's like, you have like a council of like four or five people. And it's like these five people came together and together had this collective epiphany, this collective religious experience. Right. 
I, I think that's kind of a more interesting way that we can go with it rather than make yeah. them apostles, make them equal to each other, each other. I'm fine with that. Sure. They all, I mean, they all grow in their own way and support each other and learn from each mm -hmm. other. And that's how they, that's mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. attain this enlightenment or this, uh, and this, uh, harmony within the, the giant's cock. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, the the religion of the giant's cock, of course. Yeah, uh, cockatry, if you will. Um, the uh, perineum pentat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Oh man, no, not going there. Okay, we're good. We got it. Uh, because otherwise, I'm sorry, I have to do this. Because otherwise, you know what happens, right? You're threatened with the dictatorship. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> take gonna happen, buddy. Take gonna happen. Wow. Oh man. Can okay. I just hit stop recording now? Or... <laughs> I mean, I gotta go through my whole spiel. But I, I yeah, know, I know. <laughs> you don't have the balls to do that, Court. I'm sorry, I'm done. I mean, uh, quite literally, factually accurate, but whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I, I feel like we're in a pretty good place. We've had our religious experience here. Mm -hmm. We're good to go. Anything else that we need to add on before we end the episode? I, I hit my dick quota, so I'm good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I right. do want to make sure that the the Monster Hunter's parakeet is with him, though, this whole time. Oh, yeah. Oh, very, very important. Yeah. I was actually picturing her for the Monster Hunter. Yeah, that worked. Sure. Yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah, no, uh, noted parakeet all up in there. hundred percent. Got it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I feel like we're in a good place. That's going to do it for this episode of world build with us. A big thank you again to one Diplo Raptor for this particular prompt. Remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, where you can click the link, follow some instructions, and within a reasonable amount of time, we'll be building your world. You can follow us on social media, on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, you might be listening to on YouTube right now. And if that's the case, go ahead and hit all the buttons that YouTube likes in algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you want to come and talk to us more directly, we've got a Discord for that in the link of this very episode. Click it. Follow us and come chat with us about, hey, where would you live in the Giants continent? Please keep it not that weird. Although, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, listen, if you want to come and give us money, if you're like, you know what? Dick jokes, A plus this time. Rob, I really love the dictator joke, especially. Here's some money. Or if you just want some sweet, sweet patron-only goodies, like two episodes for your prompts, you can go to our Patreon and thank us there by giving us money and keeping the podcast running. So with all of that out the way, that's going to do it for World Build with us. Remember that we love you very much. We're going to get through this together. Until next week. Bye.